Welcome to Gaslit Nation. I am your host, Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller, Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, which Putin, a genocide that Putin is now carrying out today, 90 years after Stalin's original crime. Um, And just a reminder to our Gaslit Nation listeners, we are having the Make Art Workshop, the business side of things, April 11, 7 p.m. Eastern, only for our subscribers at the True Tar level and higher on Patreon. Um, That is going to be where I share my strategies, my brilliant business management skills (laughs) on how I got Mr. Jones made with zero Hollywood connections and just being generally socially awkward and having a vicious gremlin voice of doubt inside my head at all times. So if you want to learn the business side of things, come to of making art and getting your voice out there in the world, uh, come to that. That's April 11, 7 p.m. Eastern. And you can get your ticket for that event uh, by signing up at the truth to level, the $5 a month level or higher on patreon.com forward slash gaslit. That's patreon.com forward slash gaslit. Thank you to everyone who supports the show. So there's a lot to talk about. Joining me are the ladies of the Kremlin File podcast, an essential podcast. Gaslit Nation's own audio engineer listens to it (laughs) religiously. Uh, So we're all in the same family here. And this week, we are going to be covering the Crocus Theater attack and what it means for U.S. foreign policy, as well as Trump's MAGA cult. Then we're going to get into the latest reporting on 60 Minutes on Havana Syndrome and taking you back into that issue, which we've long covered here on Gaslit Nation. And then where is the Ukraine aid from Congress? And what is Kremlin asset Mike Mike Judge? I was thinking of of idiocracy. What is uh, Mike Johnson up to there? And if we have time, we may have to save it for later bonus episodes. We'll be looking at Paul Manafort being back on the Trump campaign and Macron's tough talk on Russia continued and the European response to the Kremlin's global war against all of us, no matter where we live. And all right, so Olga... Lotman, Russian mafia expert, and Monique Kamara, a brilliant analyst based in Italy. Welcome back to Gaslit Nation, the wind beneath my wings. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Andrea. Thanks. All right, you two. There's lots to cover here. I'm going to just do a really quick rundown on the March 22nd terrorist attack. There was uh, in, in, in a theater in Moscow, the Crocus Theater, the classic Russian rock band, like a band that means a lot to the average Russian, Picnic, It goes without saying that they're banned from Ukraine because they performed in Russian-occupied Crimea. Um, They were set to play the first of two sold-out shows when ISIS-K terrorists opened fire on the theater, killing over 140 people. There were horrible reports of people um, being slaughtered in stairwells, of parents vainly trying to protect their kids who were gunned down out of the... Several terrorists that were arrested, they all have so far came from Tajikistan, a, a Central Asian Republic that has a strong man at the helm that's backed by Russia. Russia itself has long been a target of ISIS. Around 10 years ago, a ISIS leader declared war on Russia, really emphasized Russia as a target. Some of the motivation that ISIS has in going after Russia include Uh, Russia's uh, scorched earth wars against Chechnya, which is a a really large Muslim population. There are two wars that Russia committed there, just really just leveling the ground. Horrible human rights war crimes that were carried out against Chechens, which was our very first warning sign of where things were going to be headed um, under a post-Soviet Russia. And then, of course, Russia's slaughter in Syria and its predominantly Muslim population there, as well as um, ISIS seeing Russia as back, uh, backing Russian puppets, uh, uh, Russian strongmen across uh, Central Asian republics. And it must be noted that migrants from Central Asia that do go to Russia to work, there's harassment videos that the average Russian likes to film harassing, beating up uh, migrants from Central Asia. And those videos go viral and they're like snuff films for some Russians over there. So it's not like these migrants really enjoy a comfortable, safe life in Russia. There's been this longstanding tension there. What needs to be noted, of course, is that the U.S. in its 
right to inform, whatever you call it, had notified in advance Russian authorities that ISIS was planning something for Moscow. There were specific details in this warning. This warning was made public. There's a public record of it. And at the time, Russian authorities dismissed it as the U.S. just trying to spook and and warmonger or whatever. And of course, these warnings came to pass. Um, It should be noted that Russian authorities have been really busy using sort of counterterrorism tactics on its own population, on anybody who dares to protest the war in Ukraine and so on, or, or to demand a better future in Russia. There was a heartbreaking account by one Russian dissident who's based now in Lithuania where she runs a Russian language YouTube account to try to get news out to a Russian speaking audience back home. Uh, She had to flee Russia when she was put on parole after being arrested for, for organizing protests in her town just demanding better services for her daughter uh, who uh, was in critical care and um, the Ministry of Health or whatever wasn't getting the medicine, wasn't getting the services that our daughter needed to stay alive. And so Russian authorities' reaction to this was to put a surveillance camera in her central air unit above her bed and send her photographs of her sleeping in bed to let them know that they're watching her. And then they, of course, arrested her and put her in prison. And her daughter uh, was then neglected and died. And so when this woman was finally released from prison, she fled to Lithuania and continues her work there under great threat of the Russian regime. So all of this, the Crocus Theater attack as a reminder that Putin's contract, the KGB dictatorship's contract with the people of Russia, this sort of mythology that they will keep the average Russian safe, they will protect them from the mess of democracy that they experienced in the so-called uh, 1990 car bomb 1990s in Russia, where things were so destabilized, rampant violence across Russia and uh, economic instability and poverty, but also a time of potential and, and hope for many. So that was sort of the experiment with dem- short-lived experiment with democracy that Russians underwent, and the con the social contract between the Kremlin and the Russian. The average Russian in St. Petersburg and Moscow, uh, not in the occupied re- ethnic republics, but the average white Russian is, we'll keep you safe, we'll pump you full of that easy, dirty, corrupt Russian cash, and in exchange, you just keep your head down and live your life and let us rule and enrich ourselves. But in recent years, that contract, of course, is fraying as more and more Russians are getting shoved into to Putin's meat grinder in Ukraine, and now this terrorist attack. Um, So I'm going to turn it over to Olga and Monique to give their thoughts on this and where they think things are headed. And I have more to say on the U.S. foreign policy implications as well as where it pertains to Trump's MAGA cult. First of all, the first warning sign where uh, the FSB and Putin and, you know, the whole uh, Chakas state was headed was in 1999 when Putin and Petrushev uh, participated in blowing up buildings Uh, to kill their own civilians. They are very well known for organizing terrorist attacks. Russians have never been spared from this. And that led to the Second Chechen War that we saw basically the carpet bombing of Grozny and um, everything there. So frankly, and I'm pretty sure that all Western intelligence agencies at the time knew that it was FSB and Petrushev at the helm of FSB and Putin uh, who were responsible because of Nova Gazeta, you know, who was doing amazing work um, documenting this, I'm sure. Um, and then at the same time, Litvinenko, who had fled Russia, who was former FSB and had, you know, details on it, which eventually came out, you know, via his interviews in a book before he was poisoned with polonium in London, um, then we should have known. So it's not beyond Russia to commit these terrorist attacks. I mean, they have done it. They're known for it. They've used terrorism domestically in the Soviet Union. They've partnered with terrorist organizations. Some of their best partners are terrorist organizations, both from Soviet days to modern Russia. Um, And I mean, even with organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and, um, you know, terrorist organizations across Africa. I mean, they they work hand in hand with them when the case needs to be. So with this said, uh, the Crocus attack, 
interestingly, from what it looks like, um, Russia started laying the groundwork for it a year ago. We don't know if they did it or if they just looked the other way to allow it to happen. But at a minimum, what we do know is that one year ago in February of 23, um, the SVR head, Narishkin, came out with a very bizarre evidence that he had seen that the United States and UK are recruiting ISIS and al-Qaeda members to send to Ukraine, then to push through into Russia to conduct terrorist attacks on Russian soil. So this was one year ago. And then over the past year, they kind of, you know, it came through the FSB head and continued, you know, here and there surfacing until, sure enough, this is what happened. The U.S. did warn that there was going to be an attack. And interestingly, the U.S. provided the warning, then followed by the U.K. and then several other countries. I believe it was March 7th, um, late afternoon, this warning came out. Interestingly, in the morning, the breaking news when I was when I checked overnight as I was going to sleep was that Russia had arrested several ISIS-K members for uh, supposedly um, planning to blow up a synagogue. And we've seen, you know, I like over the past several months in like in Gushetia, we've seen uh, and Dagestan and, you know, several other regions. We have seen Russia, you know, supposedly FS, the local FSB fighting, hey, call it locals who allegedly are connected to ISIS-K. And even in the past, you know, week, uh, there were two judges in Ingushetia who got arrested for allegedly being involved with, you know, or or in support of ISIS-K. And so, I mean, this is something that's well known. So that's at a minimum, Russia, you know, did know about this. I mean, we can go, you know, there's not enough evidence right now to know what exactly happened. And it will take time. The evidence will come out. But at this moment, there isn't enough evidence except to know that Russia knew the attack was coming. Russian security forces all disappeared, almost like during when Prigozhin was carrying out his mutiny. You had the police stations who were, frankly, not that far away within two minute car drive nowhere to uh, to be seen. You had, you know, various agencies within the vicinity who just didn't appear for about an hour. And you had 20 minutes of these terrorists, you know, carrying out this attack freely. And then uh, and, uh, they were able to get away. Now, Moscow is one of the most heavily surveilled cities there is. I mean, there literally is a camera everywhere. The fact that these people were able to go all the way to near Bryansk you know, Russia, of course, jumped in and said, oh, they were heading back to Ukraine. First of all, where they were stopped, it was at a crossroad where you can take one highway to Ukraine, the other highway to Belarus. And Belarusian officials came out and said, oh, we are securing our borders to stop the terrorists from coming in. So basically, the whole story of what the FSB and what, you know, various agencies inside of Russia have been saying, the National Security Council, the Kremlin, everything has holes in it. And when there are so many holes, obviously there's something there. Because, you know, if you legitimately investigate something, you don't have arrest immediately. You don't have, you know, all these answers before you even, uh, you know, when you just begin the investigation. You know what I mean? And this is what happened. It's like Russia already had a story scattered. They were testing it out via propaganda channels literally minutes after the attack that it was Ukraine and that it's America and it's the UK and NATO. Anyway, so um, they were testing different versions out. And I mean, with Russia, the reason you see so many versions is because they like to confuse the situation. I mean, this has happened, you know, uh, with the 99 uh, apartment building bombings, with the Veslin hostage situation, frankly, with anything. They always put so many versions out that, you know, it's difficult to get to the point of what it is. And again, eventually there will be answers. Just right now, there's just a whole fog of confusion. Also, let me remind you that for Russia, it's advantageous to have a terrorist attack because 
Look, everyone has been talking about, oh, they could use it for mobilization. First of all, Putin can order mobilization of everyone. They don't need a terrorist attack for that. He could just sign the paper and say, you have to go. What is anyone going to do? I mean, people come out with a piece of paper blank and get arrested. So they're not going to go and fight the Kremlin. If anything, they all attempt to flee Russia or they go to the front. But for him, it's advantageous because also there's a few other things happening inside of Russia, like Russia, you know, over the past few years and now escalating an official nationalization of companies. And there are things enough to distract from what Putin's whatever fifth term is and what's coming down the pipeline. So what better way than to have people busy inside with terrorist attacks and then Shortly after the crocus attack, you had literally days of every single shopping center in Moscow and and um, uh, St. Petersburg being emptied out because people are calling in bomb threats. Um, and there's been a lot of mining threats over the past few weeks. And just to remind you to finish off, in 19, 2019, I believe it was 19, when there were actual protests building across the country. Russia, the Kremlin was getting scared. You know, they were, felt very uncomfortable with these protests building because it wasn't just, you know, the Moscow and St. Petersburg, but it was happening across the country, all the way to the Far East. And at that time, coincidentally, they uh, happened to have a terrorist attack in the St. Petersburg station. I remember following it very closely And I remember like, oh, look how convenient, sure enough. And even writing and saying, oh, now comes the lockdown that people can gather because that's, you know, the the natural thing for the Kremlin to do. Sure enough, after this terrorist attack, they did, you know, enforce uh, measures that due to the, you know, threat of terrorism, people can no longer gather in crowds over national security risks. So, I mean, it played very well into them. And again, it's playing very well. And on top of building, you know, this, uh, you know, attempted blame on Ukraine that Ukraine is behind it to kind of build this anger within the Russian population, who frankly could care less, uh, you know, either way. You have a huge faction of Russians who do support the war and think Ukraine is not enough and, you know, they should go and take everything, um, including Italy and France and Germany and, and everywhere that they can get their hands on. And then you have another faction who's just a political and they just don't want to know nothing. They don't care. They stick their head in the sand, mm. you know, go to work, try to like whatever, feed their families. They don't want to know nothing. And here it's, you know, an attempt also to build that outrage and the anger. And we've seen Russia use these tactics in the West because every time they want to confuse, you know, situation or or uh, create more tensions within a country, they resort to disinformation mm. operations and uh, other types of operations within these countries in order to stoke hatred and fear and anger and, you know, all the worst qualities to get people occupied. So we will see what the final outcome of this when the evidence comes out. And again, it will come out because (laughs) FSB, like everything else, you know, they will sell this information to someone. To somebody. Really happened. And um, we'll see where it goes from there. But as far as the read now, this is basically it. I want to make the... The point that so ISIS K ISIS is a real threat. It's a resilient terrorist organization. France, which is hosting the Olympics this summer, is on high alert. You have soldiers now with their rifles out patrolling uh, tourist hotspots in France now. And obviously, the Olympics are going to be a big target this summer, as well as other uh, targets across Europe. There was, for instance, a ISIS attack planned against the Swedish parliament that was stopped, prevented, and and arrests were made there. It's not just Europe that they have their eyes on in their growing global terrorist war. It's also Iran. There was a big uh, ISIS attack in Iran in January of this year, where 90 or so people were killed and and 100 plus more were injured. So ISIS has regrouped. 
they're back. They are uh, growing their numbers in, in places like Afghanistan. U.S. national security warned uh, when when Netanyahu and his band of terrorists uh, that have hijacked Israel's government, and Netanyahu is uh, clinging to his forever war and his latest coup to stay in power. U.S. national security analysts were warning that having this forever war in Gaza against Palestinians was going to be a international security threat and lead to further radicalization. So ISIS can really, really recruit off of this and so on. And so my big concern, one of the first things that came to mind after this attack, ISIS attack, was how Russia in recent history, has very much used ISIS opportunistically to try to force alliance, an easy alliance, but uh, an alliance with the West to together fight ISIS. And what I could see Donald Trump doing, especially if if there's more ISIS attacks, including in European capitals, um, I could see Trump campaigning off of this. I could see, um, I could see Trump saying that, you know, like we need to be allies with Russia. We need to join with Russia to fight ISIS, fight this global threat. Because one thing that Americans, especially the voters that are needed, these independent voters in these very close swing states, one thing that really gets to them are brown people. And so when you have brown terrorists as opposed to white terrorists like Netanyahu, that when you have brown terrorists, that will really drive out that vote that's needed, right? And so if Trump's going to be the tough on terror guy, that's what worries me, is that his MAGA cult's going to get really riled up this election over a, a strong resurgent ISIS threat. We saw this happening in Obama's foreign policy, where the Obama team made the argument that they had to work side by side with Russia to, on the Iran deal to negotiate that because Russia was a close ally of Iran, and also in Syria and in, in Iraq and combating ISIS together. And as a result, you had Russia then knifing uh, the U.S. in the chest with its attack on our democracy in 2016 to to bring their longtime asset Donald Trump to power with the help of their longtime operative Paul Manafort. So my worry is that Trump's going to use this opportunistically and some of the dubs or some of the shit for brain (laughs) folks inside U.S. foreign policy, the U.S. foreign policy establishment are going to use this to give Russia way too much leeway in working with the West on on combating ISIS when Russia cannot be trusted. What are your thoughts on that? I thought when you said they were using them advantageously, I thought uh, you meant like during the 16, 17 elections in Europe where there were terrorist attacks as, um, as, uh, hey, call it, you know, they were propping up the far right movements. We are going to have the same exact repeat. And again, as I said before, Russia is one of the biggest supporters of terrorist organizations. They are a terrorist state. They fund terrorist organizations. And here, I would, you know, they, I mean, I don't think, I could be wrong, I don't think Europe and U.S. will fall for working with Russia as they are committing a genocide and as NATO is on high alert of Russia attacking a NATO country. So I don't see this happening, Um, you know. As far as with Trump, I mean, his 30% of the base, you know, they believe whatever he sells them. For other people, I mean, they will look at the fact like, why would we partner with Russia to combat ISIS when Russia is committing a genocide in Ukraine? I mean, Russia is striking Ukrainian infrastructure. Russia is, you know, I hate call massacring Ukrainians in occupied held territory. I mean, we hear so many atrocities coming out. So I don't see this. I see Trump doing this. I warned last year that Trump may even use coordinate, well, not coordinate directly, but that Russia will push through terrorists through our border because they have operations on the Mexican border and, you know, and they're very, have a lot of influence in Nicaragua and Ecuador and Argentina and Venezuela, which Maduro is um, allegedly going there soon to Russia to sit down with Putin. 
I um, did, you know, warn that Russia can take advantage of what's happening in the border, uh, weaponize it, and push through terrorists here to potentially set off a series of attacks on U.S. Home, uh, soil. Frighteningly enough, a few months ago, Trump repeated the same exact thing, that uh, he is confident that we're going to have one major terrorist attack in the U.S. or a series of them. So there is, uh, I don't think they're directly coordinating this, but I do think Russia would take advantage. And we have seen Russia doing this with the weaponization in um with the Belarusian border and with the weaponization with the Finland border. The Finns closed the border off, you know, instantly. They weren't having any of that. Whereas in Belarus, it became, you know, quite a bigger thing. Um, and they were flying, you know, uh, hey, call it people from the Middle East, from Africa, flooding Belarus's uh, border to try to push them through Poland. And at the same time, there were people within the Belarusian opposition who said that Russia was training terrorists um, to push through in this wave of migrants so they can be planted in European capitals to set off terrorist attacks at Russia's choosing. So, I mean, again, like I said, when it comes to Russia and terrorism, it's hand in hand. Yeah. Well, the thing that I'm listening to, you know, uh, Andrea and Olga, um, all your comments, and the one thing that has that really, like I underlined, as I'm sitting here listening, I'm taking little notes, and it's the atmosphere of fear that is being built and stoked and nurtured in Europe just before our elections in June in the United States. I mean, you have Trump who publishes a photograph of Biden gagged and bound. I mean, what is that? That's terror, if you ask me. I can't believe you know, that, uh, I mean, I can believe it. Let's just put it that way. But the use of immigrants, the promise of violence, um, these are things that uh, fall right into all of the narratives that, and here, that are are being really, really beefed up. Like you take um, the two big ones, especially after all of the disinformation that came out about the, uh, the Crocus City Hall uh, massacre, that it was the CIA, U.S., uh, the CIA and uh, Ukraine and U.K., okay, that kind, you know, that kind of thing. Basically, they, right away, what I saw is all of the narratives going towards, okay, so it's the U.S. and NATO that won a third world war. I mean, they automatically, it was just absolutely insane to see that kind of connection in less than an hour. Okay, as Olga had pointed out with with that crazy, insane Medvedev and Bondarev that came out uh, just a few minutes afterwards. But it is this atmosphere of fear that uh, will be, you know, and it'll go to a very, very high degree. I think we're just starting, which is kind of scary. That's really, 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 really scary. Russia is looks to be preparing more terrorist attacks because yeah. now I'm you have the Petrushev, the king of, you know, carrying out terrorist attacks on Russian citizens when he was head of FSB and blew up <laughs> the apartment yeah. buildings. Now you have him warning that NATO is training mercenaries to send into Russia to carry out more terrorist attacks. Frankly, to me, this is all the same shit yeah. that they've been repeating since the Soviet Union. They always created yeah. this boogeyman West, uh, you know, and NATO and whatnot in order to try to, you know, convince their people. But frankly, the interesting part is that their people, whatever Russia says, their people are really not going to care. I mean, you have, like I said, a huge part of Russia who are imperialist and, you know, mm -hmm. want to go mm -hmm. back to the great Russian empire. And then you have a percentage of people who just are like, they don't care. Yeah, I call them sheep, you know, in Russian of tea, um, because they just are led to wherever and just, you know, kind of mind their business and don't get involved and are apolitical and don't want to know what's happening anywhere. And that's it. And that's that. So it's interesting. They're selling this inside, again, to create this fear. But the thing is that I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make. Because what is it going to convince Russians? What, that the Kremlin needs to start a war in Ukraine as, you know, as as revenge? I mean, they're doing that. 
to eliminate infrastructure across the whole country and leave all Ukrainian cities in the dark. They are doing that to mm -hmm. what cut out tongues of Ukrainians who refused to show loyalty to Russia to rape women and children. They did all of that. So I don't see where the only thing I will say that I've been monitoring. And again, this could mm -hmm. be something to keep an eye on is there's been more chatter over the past two weeks of the use of biological or chemical weapons. Difficult, you're not going to have a mass effect. You can cause terrorist from terrorism the fear of, of an attack like this. But as far as a localized effect, I mean, as far as a far wide effect across Ukraine to murder every Ukrainian, it's difficult using a biological weapon. But there has mm. been more a sharp turn towards Russia's uh, propagandists and politicians talking about uh, using chemical weapons, using biological weapons, even tactical nuclear weapons, because they feel they need to preserve, you know, all the landmarks in Ukraine, but they need to eliminate, as they call Ukrainians, biological matter, which is now that's what Ukrainians sanitary. are. Yeah. yeah. No, that's not the sanitary. The sanitary. That's, uh, that's different. They're now talking about all Kiev, Kharkiv, everywhere, that they just need to eliminate Ukrainians as biological matter they're referring yeah, to. Yeah, no, it, I meant I meant all over Ukraine. I meant all over Ukraine. Yeah, so I that's mean, only... I didn't mean just the, the eastern part. I meant all over. Yeah, so that's the only chatter I've seen is, you know, a more sharp move towards that, towards just, like, basically committing a mass, mass genocide. Again, Russia has been trying to do this. They haven't been successful. Ukrainians are resilient. They will fight and fight and fight to protect the country and to protect their future. But it's just, uh, you know, more so that we need weapons like now, yesterday, before yeah. yesterday. So I want, I want to touch on uh, Monique's point about this climate of violence. If Donald Trump wins the 2024 election, there's going to be violence. If Donald Trump loses the 2024 election, there's going to be violence. And it's coming from his cult of violence, MAGA. It was Trump supporters that wanted to kidnap and hogtie and, and rape and assault and torture uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the popular Democratic governor of Michigan. And then they repeated this imagery again, Trump did, with, with the President of the United States hogtied. In, in the back of a pickup truck, where that is a that is a trombone dog whistle to his MAGA cult of violence to inflict assassination attempts on public officials, large and small. Because if if his MAGA cult members can't get to Biden, maybe they can get to their governor. Maybe they can get to their state uh, representative in their capital they could drive down to their capital and and you know you have a state official walking up the capitol steps heading into work and they can they can try something there if you look back on the same sort of atmosphere of violence we had it going into the brexit vote where a popular female mp joe cox was murdered by a far right white terrorist and that was another heightened atmosphere of violence of inflamed by russian disinformation you had a massive troll bot operation, not to mention a lot of Russian dirty money flowing into that Brexit vote, which was primarily driven by Nigel Farage, who was an open and proud fanboy of Putin. And now we're having a repeat of all of this here in the United States. And it's and we're just in early days of this election. So much can happen between now and then. And I do worry about white domestic terrorism here and how, uh, and I do worry about ISIS, quite frankly. You know, I have family and friends in Paris. My husband's from Paris. So I worry about the target on their heads with the Olympics coming up there. And um, I worry about the ISIS escalating their attacks. I worry about the MAGA cult jumping on that to, to further their activity, their terrorism against us, and really sort of in, getting inflamed over that and driving out the independent voters that are needed to win and what's going to be an extremely nail-biter close election in this electoral college. Especially in the last, I don't know how long, because I don't really follow all of Trump's rallies. But what I do see and have seen in the past few months, almost a religious quality 
about you know his his followers the maga cult has really taken on a religious spin and that's extremely dangerous because if you think that you're doing this for god you will you know commit violence under that uh let's say with that excuse with that justification i saw a reportage not long ago i mean if we remember that that first time, I mean, besides all of those prayer meetings with all those people around him, and that's been amplified now. That's been extended even more. And then you had the whole Bible, right, in front of, he was holding up a Bible. I remember that. So this this is really, really, really concerning when you see this kind of thing, because once you get religious, okay, and I'm talking about not even, religious is not even the right word, once you start weaponizing religion for this kind of violence, it's very difficult. We see it, right, in radical, uh, in radical religions all over the world. Okay, not just Islam, but they're Islamist. Uh, there are other, okay, as well that take on, all right, the, the the religious mantle to kill people. So that's that's very concerning. Very very concerning. Yeah, I mean there. Authoritarians, strong men, want to be strong men, famously, of course, use violence to come to power and stay in power. And that's what Trump is doing about that religious symbolism. And it's it's in the larger far right movement. I mean, out of Texas, a far right hostage state, a Republican hostage state, they're sending a red heifer to Israel to be paraded at a famous mosque there to try to claim that it's some long-held doomsday prophecy. And of course, you have the American far right playing into this because Trump's core base, white evangelicals, believe in the destruction of Israel as part of their own doomsday prophecy. Globally, we're living in this time of heightened violence driven by these strong men and want to be strong men. And it reminds me so much of Orwell's 1984, where Winston Smith is going about his business. He's walking around and there's bombs blowing up around him. And that's just part of the atmosphere of a dystopia is just this casual violence living in this state of violence. And it just becomes so normalized. I agree that we have to be worried. I agree that we obviously every agency is on heightened alert. I will say I am less worried now um, for a mass attack by domestic terrorists than um, in 2020 because, um, and a good indicator was because in 2020, everything was under Trump's control, all the agencies. So there, you know, we saw January 6th and how everyone just kind of disappeared, slinked away, and the Capitol Police were being, you know, left to handle this violent terrorist who were beating them, uh, you know, senselessly killed several and whatnot. But a good indicator was when Trump tried to rile his base up for the FBI searches. And, you know, Everyone was kind of holding their breath to see if the FBI crosses the line and does carries out these searches, you know, in his residences, residences, whether his movement will just like go full force. Interestingly enough, what happened is that they started planning. They were planning to attack FBI, you know, headquarters across the country and in the planning, they got so paranoid within their own chats that they thought that, oh, yes, this is an FBI setup. That is an FBI setup. And what we got was one sociopath who, frankly, didn't get the memo and decided to, a lone wolf, decided to go attack an FBI, shoot at an FBI um, station, and then ended up getting killed by the National State Police. So I worry more about these lone attacks than more of an organized, because I think after January 6th, what the U.S. did very well was to make sure that every single insurrectionist was held accountable, minus Trump. We're still waiting for that. But that they were held accountable, because guess what? Trump, literally, they were his sacrificial lambs. They're all sitting in prison or unemployed with a criminal record. Their life has been completely, you know, upended. And Trump is still carrying on and making money off of this after their lives got in their eyes destroyed because of what they did on January 6th. They're paying the price. 
So now I think there's more caution with causing a big movement only because of that, because they do worry about, I hate to call it, uh, this being a setup. And the movement in a place like Texas would have no effect. I mean, if they want to create a big movement, it would have to be in D.C. or New York or a blue state. There is absolutely no agency in any blue state that's going to tolerate that shit. We need to be on high alert. But at the same time, I am a drop more confident that, you know, it's not going to be like January 6th if Trump loses, uh, only because of that. Because our agencies know everything. They have people embedded in all these organizations across the country. And I think, you know, that will kind of save us a drop. (laughs) Well, there's always those lone wolves. They're there. There's consistent terrorist attack. Yesterday, I don't know, actually, I haven't followed the news, Mm -hmm. um, and I might absolutely be completely unrelated, but yesterday, I mean, there was breaking news that somebody, you know, rammed, decided to ram their uh, car into the the FBI thing. They were trying to get into the FBI uh, property in Georgia, and then the ramp came up, and they ended up ramming their car in the ramp. I don't know what the circumstances are behind it, whether it's related to this or not. I do think that Trump slightly is weakened from there. Yes, online, it seems like hell, because we're being fed this hell by platforms, especially Twitter, Mm -hmm. where they want, want us to see you know, all this like violence and threats and chaos. But then, you know, in the real life, it's it's not, I mean, there is something to be worried about. I mean, and every law enforcement agency between Department of Justice and Homeland Security, they are monitoring everything and, you know, and they have everyone on heightened alert this year. But I still feel a little more confident because our agencies are under American, you know, officials, not under Trump and his cronies when he controlled everything in 2020, where we saw the result of that. I will add before switching topics, um, I want to believe that. Washington Post reporter Kara Lessig wrote a great book on how the Secret Service is infiltrated by the cult of MAGA. So let's hope in the months ahead that the people we need (laughs) are under real uh, protection. Look, it's going to be what it's going to be, but um, and we're going to be there to respond to it um, with all the powers that we have. And people shouldn't be in a fetal position at all because we need people to stay engaged and active and make phone calls and get out the vote and know that we're ultimately going to overwhelm them um, at the ballot box because there's more of us than there are of them. And so along this whole thread of violence, I want to bring up, of course, Havana Syndrome. 60 Minutes had this big um, segment that was helped with reporting from The Insider, a Russian dissident news outlet, on um, a direct link between an FBI agent who was working specifically on a Russian spy case in Florida who was attacked twice by an electronic weapon that has left her with permanent brain damage, where she has um, issues still and she's just she experienced um, uh, in the period after the attack what felt like Alzheimer's. And um, I want to read now from Axios, uh, just giving the scope of the this electronic weapon. Overall, U.S. officials estimate that some 1,500 cases of Havana syndrome among U.S. government personnel have been reported across 96 countries. These include suspected cases in China, India, Austria, and Vietnam. And I'll link to this in the show notes. And um, it's called Havana syndrome because the earliest known cases or the cases that got the most attention uh, initially came out of uh, the American embassy in Havana when President Obama opened up relations with Cuba, Cuba being a dictatorship that is largely financially subsidized by Russia and has been used um, to create terror against, uh, historically against uh, the U.S. throughout the Cold War. A lot of Russian spies are there coming through there. There's been a lot of known cases, of course, in countries like Ukraine. There was concern uh, that P- Vice President Kamala Harris may have been impacted, and certainly members of, of her team, around people around her had been impacted. 
had been attacked. And then um, on top of that, it points to this larger history, this fascination the Kremlin has with electronic weapons. During the Cold War in the 1950s and 1960s, the Russians bombarded electronic waves at the American embassy in Moscow. And there were several cases of cancers that came out of the, that personnel that served in, in that outpost. We've been saying for a very long time on Gaslit Nation that the Russians were very clearly behind Havana Syndrome. Many of these cases targeted people that were directly working to confront Russia, to stop Russia, to also stand up to Donald Trump and to hold Trump accountable. These are cases that are meant to um, not only take people, the men and women we need out in the field to protect us, out of service. These are cases also to threaten, to intimidate, to demoralize, and to crush recruitment, to sabotage recruitment efforts by the United States government to get more talent into these important roles of the CIA and the FBI to protect our national security. So it really covers a lot of bases of advantages for Russia and its war against us. It's an, it's an extraordinarily effective weapon. And I'm glad that it's finally, after so many idiots across the media tried to downplay it, laugh it off. You had Glenn Greenwald blaming, saying that it was a bunch of hysteria, that it was a bunch, that the, the cause were crickets. You know, you don't get this, with, with 1,500 cases, this isn't hysteria. The men and women across the FBI and the CIA, they are trained and they are recruited out of toughness. These are tough individuals. And they're physically tough. They're trained to be mentally, emotionally tough. These are not people that would easily succumb to hysteria. So when you have this, this extraordinary number of cases across the world in 96 countries, it's very clear that there's a there there. And the scientists, the researchers who are tasked with working on this um, have, have very much said that, yes, there is permanent brain damage here uh, with many of the, the victims. Now, the U.S. intelligence agencies came out with a report um, a few years ago under the Biden administration saying that no Havana syndrome is not credible. And then you had uh, Anthony Blinken's State Department hiring um, someone to basically be the point person for dealing with Havana syndrome cases. And they came out saying, well, we can't really confirm one way or the other. And that really outraged the victims and their families. At the time when this reporting was coming out, I pointed out that the cover-up by the Biden administration was likely being done to try to push back against this because they were probably worried about their recruitment ability to try to get people to sign up for these much needed uh, outposts in our ongoing war against Russia. What happens when you are forced to be at war with the Russians? They've waged war. They're waging war against you. They're committing all sorts of uh, successful operations like Solar Winds, which was a cyber war per har harbor uh, during the height of the pandemic in 2020 um, that, that disrupted a lot of uh, sensitive infrastructure for the U.S., like businesses and, and hospitals and so on. When you are forced to defend yourself against the Russians, you need good men and women out in the field. You need people to fill these jobs, meaning relocating and moving and taking their families with them. How can you possibly get that to happen with all of these reports with Havana syndrome? So that was my theory on why the Biden admin would have led essentially what was a cover up because Havana syndrome is credible. It is happening. The three of us are aware of somebody in our network who has suffered permanent brain damage because of it and is ongoing and dealing with ongoing um, physical therapy for that. It's so I just want to tell all of our listeners, Havana syndrome's real. It's always been real. And anybody in the media that tries to downplay this threat is showing their own ignorance, especially when it comes to foreign policy, especially when it comes to Kremlin terrorist tactics, and especially when it comes to the global war that we're up against and, and the ways the U.S. is struggling to deal with it. So what are your thoughts on this? We had wanted to talk about this for quite a while. Finally, they're getting this visibility, all of the people that have suffered, okay, through this. Because let's remind everybody, it's not just this. They have a daily, these diplomats and uh, all of the consular staffs that are located in missions all over the world are daily harassed on a daily basis, and they do all sorts of tricks and and terrible things, okay, to make their life a real hell. 
Oh, they'll break into someone's home and rearrange their furniture just to mind fuck them. Oh, no, they do a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, I mean, it's it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, but I'm glad that they got the visibility because this is extremely important. There were some articles that had come out maybe about three years ago, but even before that, most most likely. But they never got the traction that was necessary. So I'm glad that it was, I think, Insider, uh, Der Spiegel, mm-hmm. and also uh, 60 Minutes that they all teamed up and brought this out into the public. And I don't know about the technical side, what the U.S., would have to do in their embassies and in their consular, you know, uh, mission, in the missions, wherever they are, what they would have to do to protect against this thing. I have absolutely no idea because it's there's it's a technical thing that, you know, um, I would maybe, maybe a follow-up story on, on people who deal with this kind of stuff. The Chinese, do they protect themselves knowing that the Russians are going to do this to them? And how do they protect themselves? Or is it the Chinese that actually do this as well? Well, right? from what it seems, this seems to be that you have to be at a closer frequency, mm-hmm. uh, like a closer distance. So I'm sure that the Russians aren't crawling up that close to Chinese because they're not the targets. So I think, you know, as far as with protection, I, I it's pretty hard because one of the uh, counterintelligence FBI agents was in her freaking home. I mean, what are you going to yeah. protect your home? Yeah. Like, what do you Yeah, you what know? do you do? Look, we've been following this for quite a while. I remember being completely outraged and infuriated that this was happening in D.C. I mean, you had Americans being attacked in D.C. on U.S. soil, and you had the government covering this up. And I personally think the sole reason for the cover-up is because no one wants to escalate with Russia. Everything goes back to To if we admit this is happening, if we admit Russia is attacking American citizens, now physically attacking American citizens, we need a response. And the Russians have done, you know, Similar with other countries, you know, where where like when Turkey shot down their plane, you know, they kind of looked the other way because they did not want to go out into a full fledged war with Turkey. And this is the same here. It's just and it go. We see it every single day in Ukraine. I mean, everything Ukrainians are sitting there with no ammo, no weapons that uh, that should have been delivered. Uh, you know, forget even the package from Congress, but actual, like, uh, where are the F-16s? Where are all the planes? Where's the air cover? Why is Ukraine... Israel, okay. Yeah, but why is Ukraine one of the biggest countries, I believe the second largest country in Europe, why is uh, Ukraine not have an airport? What other country yeah. does not have an airport uh, open? functioning because of a war. I mean, uh, this is absurd. Yeah, what is. other European and, and uh, you know, U.S. cities are sitting without electric? And we're not giving Ukrainians everything they need. And it is because of this escalation. Everybody's so worried about, one, escalating with Russia and having a direct confrontation, and two, Russia collapsing and then, you know, them not knowing what go- comes forward. First of all, newsflash, Russia is going to collapse. So they better start preparing for that. And as far as escalation, you cannot worry what Russia is going to do because they Uh, capitalize off of our worries. And this is the only thing I'll say with this um, electric attack or or Havana syndrome is that if we admit it, that means we need to have a response. And that means we have to directly have a response to Russia. And no one is prepared to do that. This election is here and it's happening. And it's bigger than Biden. We have the chance to hack away at corruption at the root by building our power at the all-important state level, where crucial quality of life issues from voting rights to environmental protections to LGBTQ plus rights and more are decided. Karl Rove ran the same strategy for the GOP during the Obama years, laying the groundwork for Trump to come to power in 2016. Now we're reversing this dangerous trend, securing key victories in swing states to protect our elections and advance progressive laws in states like Michigan and Wisconsin. Yes, even Wisconsin. Another world is possible when we unite and build together. Here's how. 
Join me, Andrea, at State Fair, a giving circle that collects small dollar donations among friends and family to build big power in key states. If 1,000 Gaslit Nation listeners set up a $5 recurring monthly donation, that's $5,000 we're sending to turn so-called red states purple and so-called purple states blue. Some of the races we've supported won by only a few votes. And we flipped the house in Pennsylvania, flipped the entire house, all right? Elected like 12 new people, massive. And they have a crazy, extra crazy Republican Party in in Pennsylvania. And that's what we did together through States Project. Thank you. Your $5 monthly donation will make a huge difference. Join me and my friends at State Fair today. You can sign up at gaslitnationpod.com. Just click on the 2024 Survival Guide on our homepage. Step number two, are there any young people in your life, Gen Z or younger? Give them the gift of the excellent book, Run for Something, a real talk guide to fixing the system yourself. It helps people of all ages run for office. So if you're thinking of running for office, be sure to read this inspiring and practical guide. Both the book and the organization, Run for Something, encourage, recruit, and train young people to run for office and flex their power. Inspire a young person and anyone you love and trust with empathy in their hearts and science in their minds to run for office today. Number three, help the helpers. State Bridges is a sister district action network program in which volunteers from across the country fundraise for organizations doing year-round power building in key battleground states like Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. State Bridges supports organizations engaging communities underrepresented at the polls, like mothers of color, rural voters, and Latinx voters. Sign up to attend a virtual fundraiser and donate to help the helpers at State Bridges. Number four, write letters to voters in swing districts with Vote Forward. Check out any of their easy letter writing campaigns that have already started and write letters as you listen to Gaslit Nation will be keeping you company. Most importantly, number five, check your own voter registration now at election protection site, vote.org. Make sure you're registered and check in with your family and friends to confirm their voter registration too. Commit to helping five people in your life make a plan to vote and bring them along to a Gaslit Nation phone bank this fall because the only ones coming to save us is us. Grassroots power is the most reliable power we have left. Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up at the Truth Teller level and higher on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gaslit. Support the essential work of the World Central Kitchen whose aid workers were killed in Gaza, trying to feed Palestinians trapped there in the famine genocide deliberately engineered by Israel's government. Give what you can to donate.wck.org. That's donate.wck.org. Contact your reps in Congress and demand a permanent ceasefire now and that they release a public statement if they haven't already demanding an end to Netanyahu and his coalition of terrorists' genocide of Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. To get Ukraine urgently needed humanitarian aid, join me in donating to Razum for Ukraine at razumforukraine.org. To help civilians and refugees in conflict zones, donate to Doctors Without Borders at doctorswithoutborders.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, Donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Andrea Chalupa. Our production manager is Nicholas Torres. And our associate producer is Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres. And our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smythe of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Lily Wachowski, Work for Better, Prep for Trouble, John Schoenthaler, 
Ellen McGirt, Larry Gasson, David Collier, Anne Bertino, David East, Ida, Joseph Mara Jr., Mark Mark, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Kevin Gannon, Sandra Colmans, Katie Masuris, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Marcus J. Trent, Joe Darcy, Anne Marshall, Trigve, D.L. Singfield, Nicole Spear, Jans Alstra Brasmanson, Sarah Gray, Diana Gallagher, Leah Campbell, Jared Lombardo, Anne Marshall, and Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. 